You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. For this episode, I got to sit with Finnerty Steves. Now, you know Finnerty as an actor from the shows Orange is the New Black, Half-Life, Louie, House of Cards, Smash, Sopranos, basically everything, including a lot of Broadway credits. What you may not yet know is that she just wrote, produced, and starred in her own feature film called Before, During, After. The sharp-witted dramedy studies a middle-aged NYC theater actress suddenly forced to figure out the kind of person she wants to portray in real life when her marriage comes to an end after she catches her husband cheating. It is a gorgeous film, and for this particular middle-aged woman who got divorced, it really resonated. We had a delicious talk about acting, the craft, the journey of making a movie, and going through one of those life experiences that really makes you who you are. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. Okay, here's my conversation with Vinnerty Steves. Keep in mind, this was recorded the last week of September, so we recorded remotely, and any references to recent times may be outdated. And if we refer to the upcoming election, obviously it hadn't happened yet, so that is the context. Okay, here, have a listen. Okay, so Finnerty, usually I ask people what they do, but if anyone gets one look at you, they know what you do because we've been watching you for years and you've been in every single show in the world. (laughs) But what I want to talk about also is this new film that you've made because you wrote it and produced it and star in it. And it is the most delicious indie film I have seen in so long. Oh, thank you. (laughs) So let's talk about it. It's called Before, During, After. Give us the elevator pitch. It is about a middle-aged woman who is forced to figure out the kind of person she wants to be when her seemingly perfect marriage falls apart. And it is a a personal story (laughs) that I wrote. I wondered if that is autobiographical. Because I too have lived that story. So the whole thing resonated with me so much. But it's so beautifully done. though. And I I don't want to give anything away that you don't want to give away. But in it, you're doing this audition and this monologue. And through the course of it, you're having flashbacks through your whole marriage and this whole journey. I mean, it's such a beautiful finding your voice, almost coming of age, even though it's a midlife thing as it's happening. Like what, what inspired you to do this? You know, I've always, I've, I've always wanted to write, but I didn't know that I ever really had a story to tell. And um, I've been fascinated with, with writers. Uh, And then when when my marriage fell apart, there was a small part of me that was sort of aware of some of the absurdity that was happening. Um, and I knew I couldn't laugh at the time, but just I don't know if it's just as a as a as an artist, as an actor, you're, you're sort of aware that like, you know, if this wasn't me, this would be really funny. And maybe someday I will try to write this. And mm-hmm. I've always talked about writing and never actually did it. And I, I was challenged when um, when a friend of mine sort of was inspired by by my story and wrote something. And I was upset at first because I thought, well, I was going to write that. And then, and then I was like, where you been? You were going to, you were going to write that because you know you're 40 years old. You've never written anything. Right? Where you though? <laughs> yeah, right. So it challenged me in a way to see if I could do it. And uh, I signed up for a, a class at NYU and, and um, met an incredible teacher there, Jason Greif, who kind of has been a mentor to me. And I, you know, I, I was sharing these pieces. Uh, and not in linear order, but I was like, I don't know if this is anything, but you know, this is, um, and he's like, this is your movie. This is your movie. You have us riveted because you're telling it to us in pieces and it feels like a divorce. (laughs) Like we're trying to put the pieces back together. And, um, so I can't totally take credit for the fact that I meant to do that initially, but it was just the way it was kind of spilling out of me. And, and I am obsessed with this idea of memory and time and, and as actors, how we also like a separate sort of thing is how actors use our own lives to um, to fuel us. And um, I've always been a very emotionally available actor, but during during this time in my life, I completely shut down and I wasn't able to go there. And I was so pissed that I was like, "You took this from me." <laughs> that was, you know, that this was my thing, my gift, the thing that I had to sort of share. And I felt like I wasn't able to do it. And um, So I I was fascinated with that idea, too, of like how actors use. Um, And and it really was during this time I auditioned for a beautiful play. Um, It's an incredible play. I was sobbing as I was reading it. and I could not wait to go into the room. And then when I got in the room to audition, I could not. I couldn't go there. I was like and, and you could tell the director was like trying to work with me and he was lovely. And 
and said similar lines to that I that I actually put in, in the film where he was like, I don't he's like, if you can even imagine, <laughs> if you can even imagine this woman whose life she, you know, she thought she knew was perfect and 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 everything she thought she knew about her marriage has completely fallen apart. If you can even imagine that. And I was like, uh yeah, <laughs> I can't actually. Yeah, um, the problem is I'm living <laughs> in it in the middle of it. Yes, yes. So um, so that was another theme that I wanted to play with, this idea of, of memories and time and how, you know, without giving anything away, it is all from Jenny's point of view, the main character's point of view. So we never get his side of the story. There's no scenes with him and the other woman or him and his buddies talking about what's not working for him and his marriage. So I like this idea of playing with memory to in order to move on and move forward and how memories change how a memory can be a favorite memory and then over in, in one instant could be crushed to be a horrible memory. And, and then also how you can use some, sometimes use memories to move forward. So Yeah. It's, it's funny what you said about the uh, not being able to access the emotion as you're going through it. Cause you know, you need a little time. I think in the middle of my divorce, I remember I stopped going to yoga completely and this is not, this is not at all the same thing, but I knew if I went to yoga, I would fall apart because mm-hmm. Because you got to hold it all together with scotch tape and glue just to get through your daily life and get through it. And so it makes total sense that, of course, you can't then go and be open and vulnerable and show all those emotions because how are you going to get through the next day? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the scene towards the end where she goes on the date and then she sends the guy away? I That was such a, a moment of sisterhood and solidarity and also such a gift to him. Can you talk about that without... Giving it sure. Away. I was fascinated with this idea too of being how close we all are in marriage to uh, it was my way also of being generous of the other woman in the sense that and even my ex right and and I, I, this is loosely based on my marriage falling apart but it's not my story right so sure, even sure. even this character that she goes on a date with is not a particular person but it was I was just thinking how easy it is to to just be bored and that shiny and new isn't exciting anymore. And, and how we sort of, and it's loosely based on too, when I was a kid, I remember my parents' friends getting divorced and I thought they were just, they seemed like such an amazing couple. They were very different. He loved to camp. She loved to dance. They they were very different, but I was so, it was the first divorce that I sort of saw as a kid that I was like, what, you know? And I remember even as a little kid thinking like they got a divorce and then now suddenly the man who always loved to camp and wouldn't dance is now dancing with his new <laughs> wife and girlfriend, you know, and yeah. then she's suddenly into camping with her. New, and I'm like, why wouldn't they, they try to maybe do that? Maybe they could have worked that out. Yeah. So maybe they could have. So um, that was, has always been interesting to me of like what we're willing to kind of, who, when we, when we decide who our partner is without letting them in on our own growth or, you know, so um, I realize I'm not totally answering the question because it's um, specifically about the Clark character you're asking, right? I also really, I, I don't think this is giving it away. I wanted the end of the movie to fe- to not be about her getting the guy or the job or the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really important to me that I see my friends that are just, you know, male and female friends that are that are going through a divorce. And when they're as they're on the other side of it, they're going to be okay. It's awful. Like divorce is awful. Whether you're the person who wanted it, didn't want it, you fought for it or didn't or whatever. It's it's an awful thing. Um, but this, at the same time, there is such an opportunity for growth. And I didn't want it to be cheesy and like, oh, see, it all worked out. She got the blah, blah, blah. I wanted to just be, they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. Because you get yourself at the end. Yes. And I think that's the prize and that's the gift. And then you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think in some ways she is able to do better in some ways than he is because she didn't have, she doesn't have the regret of, did I do the right thing? Should I've worked harder? It's like it was over and I have to take care of myself and move forward. So in some ways I see that with, with friends who have been on the other side too, where uh, in some ways the person who was initially kind of you know, knocked, knocked over by the news is in some, sometimes able to really do better than the other one sometimes because they live with the guilt of like, did I do the right thing or, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, believe it or not, the image of the bird flying at the end was an accident. And it was just this like gift because it's exactly what I imagined the end to feel like. And randomly a white dove <laughs> 
in the <laughs> West Village flew by at the, I mean, it's just like this gift. It's just perfect. Yes. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, the, the director said cut and thank God, you know, the DP didn't hit the button yet. And there's this white dove that just flew through the frame. I mean, it's like, um, like ah! we did, what's crazy is we didn't even see it at the time. It wasn't until we were in, in editing that we're like, wait, what, what, wait, what was that? Cause we didn't imagine the final shot being of, of, of David. We, you know, we thought it would be of Jenny, but uh, in some ways it was of Jenny. Cause it was just this, you know, kind of this gift. Now, how did you get from divorce, writing a movie, making the movie? I, once, once I finished it, my mentor was like, you know, everyone's saying you have to, you have to sell this thing. It's incredible. So I thought about selling it. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm an actor. Why wouldn't I try to make this? And I'd never done that before. And I didn't know really what that meant, but I'm like, kids are doing that. (laughs) I can do this. Everybody's doing it. Yeah. And without even really knowing what that was. And, and I'm kind of glad I didn't because I don't know that I would have (laughs) I mean, I'm so glad I did. I'm so proud of it. But it was, I look back, I have these little, these little notebooks here, this size, and I have, you know, I I think probably 25 of them. And the first ones are like, what is an LLC? (laughs) Like literally, like I knew, I'm like, what, it's hilarious. Some of these first notebooks, because I had no idea. Um, It's like drinking water through a fire hose. Yes, yes. So we just did one thing at a time. It really it became about with our with the you know with a smaller budget. It, it became about recruiting friends. Really, did you raise money for it? I did, and I was you know I was told everyone said you know collect the nose. That's the hardest part. And yeah, I've never asked for anything in my life. I've always been somebody who I just don't like asking for help. Painful. Let alone you know, oh gosh. So my very first ask, I remember trying to word it in a way that was really clear, but didn't put them on the spot and like, you know, trying to give them an out if they needed it. And I hit send and I was sick to my stomach. And then like 25 minutes later, I get an email that's like, we're in. Yes. We'll let you know later. For, I'm like, oh my God. So like th- I was so thrilled, cried and then went, oh God, I guess that means I'm making this thing, you know, because then a check was written. And so that was the first check in um, from some dear friends. And then um, I just asked a few more people and then it became more about us trying to make it backing into a a smaller budget just it didn't make sense because I wanted to play the lead and it was important to us to sort of have some artistic control over it so it made sense for us to do it in a in a smaller scrappy way so how has it been doing you have you been submitting to festivals even though they're all online I think yes a lot of them were forced to so we were supposed to have our world premiere at River Run and that was supposed to be March 27th and oh, no. we were ready to go. Hair was dyed, you know, little outfits picked out. And um, they were one of the last to cancel, officially cancel, because they were desperate to try to figure out if they were going to cancel or reschedule. And because they're involved, you know, a lot of they just had so many theaters involved and they could not get everybody quick enough to sort of say we could reschedule. So, um, so that was devastating. But it also then kind of felt like it put a clock on because, you know, some films were just choosing to be like, okay, never mind, we're not going to do festival, then we'll just kind of take it out. But we we felt like because we had led up to that in such a big way, that it in some ways felt like it was putting a little bit of a clock on our film. And and, and there was, I was joining all these Zoom classes and, and panels and stuff about what to do. And the only good thing that came out of that also was that even people who had sold and worked on, you know, had producers who had 10 films, 20 films under their belt were on these things trying to figure out what the hell was going on. You know, like nobody knew what was happening. So like leveled the playing field. It did. It was sort of comforting to be like, we're all just sitting in our sweatpants in our bedrooms and like, you know, hopping on this, this zoom to figure out what, what's going on. And it was so easy. It was, it was scary. Cause you would hear one thing and be like, do not do virtual festivals. It's death to the film. And if some people are like, it's the, it's the only way they, they will actually be seen. Otherwise they, you know, so it just felt like the opinions were all over the place. And it was just scary. Cause it, to think that we could jeopardize the film by, by doing the wrong thing with, you know, with the festival. Yeah. So, so we ended up turning down a couple of and those first festivals that reached out to us. And it was heartbreaking because I, they were festivals I would have loved to have attended in person, but it just didn't feel right, right to have a world premiere online, yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, we, we were just getting such mixed feedback on, on what was the right thing to do or not. So we ended up Greenpoint Film Festival was they came to us and said, we would love to host your, you know, we would love to um, to have the world premiere and it's in your backyard and we're doing a socially distanced drive in. So we decided to do that. We're like, you know what, it's a little 
we were able to share the film with cast and crew and it's right in, in Brooklyn in our own backyard. And it was a gorgeous setup. They had an, I mean, it, it, it turns out it rained that night, but it didn't matter. It was like tons of family and friends in their cars. And um, so great. it was a really fun way to sort of like share it for the first time and to actually be able to do it in person. I believe it was the first week of August. So that was really nice. And then since then, we turned, we won um, Best of Fest, which was wonderful. And then right after that, River Run brought us back. So we were able to do a drive in in uh, Winston-Salem. And it was kind of great because then we got all this special attention. It was just about before, during, after and not about the whole festival. So that was great. And then we did a virtual stream West Coast premiere with Dances with Films, and we uh, we won the Industry Choice Award for that. So, um, congratulations! So we're doing really great it, with it, yeah. and we're just looking for these little gays within a very difficult year, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, the goal I imagine is to sell it. Yes. So we um, so we're reaching out now, and it's it's challenging. It's a challenging um, marketplace because it's sort of it was already sort of challenging for little indies, but since so many large films are being forced to go in different directions, it's just kind of like pushing everybody down a notch or two <laughs> in terms yeah. of you, where you thought you had a shot in. You're like that's where um, some fancier things are happening. So <laughs> now you're competing <laughs> with the Marvel movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's like okay. Um, so we're just, you know, we're just staying positive and, uh, we've had some, you know, some offers, which is really exciting. We're just trying to figure out what, what the best match is. So, so that's, that's been great. Yeah. Well, it's so lovely and it's so well done. And how did you, um, how'd you go about choosing your directors? Directors. Yeah. Yes. So I actually thought I was almost positive. I would have a female director. I just kind of always thought that that's what I would since it was a female driven story, I just, you know, so I reached out to a few friends I'd worked with before and we, and because of schedules and everything with their own projects, it was just really hard. And I felt like, because I really wanted to play the lead that we had a, a certain amount of time, because it was really important that the character be 40 and, and, and look 40. <laughs> so I did not want this to be a film that was in pre-production for nine years. You know, like I I was like, we got to get on this guys. But, um, because the baby TikTok. issue was, was really part of it too. And so I yeah. wanted, you know, so it didn't work out. But then separately, I had dear friends come to me and say, so I had my my friend Katie Hyde, who I'd worked with. Um, we were in that film Morning Glory together. We worked as actors and she's also a great uh, producer and director now. But she uh, she and her husband came to me and said, listen, we love the film. We would love, please do not feel pressure. Like you need to do what's best for your film. But we could come on like as a, as a duo. And Uh, At the same time, I had another dear friend come to me and she was like, are you open to a male director? I said, I am. I'm open. And and she's like, well, uh, Steve is really interested. Her husband, Stephen Kunkin, who's an incredible actor and a really great photographer and everything else, too. So um, I said, I'm open to it. So they came to me separately. And they're so um, so it would the idea would be that Katie would produce if, if Jack directed. And then and then I had Stephen Kunkin also. So I sat down with them separately and I was like, oh, my God, they're so different. and I, I was like, I wish there was a way I could make them one person <laughs> because they brought, they had such, they had a lot of similar strengths, but then other things that were very, very different. So since Steve comes to it, coming from an acting point of view, you know, he's an incredible actor nominated for Tony Awards, and also, but also like on Handmaid's Tale and Billions. And, you know, he's just a really accomplished actor and has incredible relationships, you know, with other really great actors. So he comes to me and he sits down with this like three ring binder with the script. And we're talking about Jenny's arc. And he's just a very sort of cerebral guy and really sort of understood Jenny and her arc. And then I sit down with Jack and Jack is like, we could do this and that. Like he's, you know, he's also an incredible, he's an incredible director, but also his uh, day job is he's one of the top colorists at Technicolor at Postworks. So he's such a visual genius. And, and since this was a nonlinear story and we were jumping around in time, he had all these great ideas in terms of color and lenses. And I was like, oh gosh, how do I make this decision? So I started Googling like, co-directors and everything is saying do not do it it's a nightmare like unless they're married or siblings co-directors are a nightmare they never met before right unless they're already a team like it seems like how how do you broach that yeah it was not this was you know this could have been a, a nightmare but it could have been offensive. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was it. So I went to them separately and said, would you be open? Mostly because of our budget too. And it was just, it would, so I kind of drew this little diagram and I, we, I said, listen guys, we let's just meet for a drink. Okay. We do not have to talk about the film, but let's just see, you know, 
so we sit down at this bar in Brooklyn and we're talking about, you know, Brooklyn and movies in general and then my film and then like, oh, wouldn't that be cool if we did this? What if we did that? And then four hours later, we were like, let's do this. And we're like, really? And, and Jack had a specific window in October that was coming up. And so we're like, we're doing it. So uh, Katie and I co-produced and then Jack and Steve directed. And I drew this little diagram on a napkin that was sort of like Katie's responsibilities, you know, Jack's and, you know, and we were like, let's do it. Let's do it. And it was a dream. It was an absolute dream. I, it's kind of incredible that it worked out. Yeah. I, I knew they're, they're both incredible guys. They're just really good men separate from talent. So it was like, this could lead to a lot of disappointment. It will not lead into any kind of crazy ego insanity. I just know them. And, and, and I didn't know them well enough. It could have gone completely haywire. But, I um, but I think more than anything, they were like, Finn, we want you, this is your baby. And so, which was hard because it's a director's medium, yet it was my story. So there was a lot of, everyone was really good. If two people were really fighting for something and the other person was like, I kind of disagree because of this or that, the person, wherever the the weight was, we were like, the other person would be like, okay, that's cool. I'm not going to, that's, that makes sense to me. So I'll let that one go. And it was incredible. And I think I really do believe it took a little longer. I'm not going to lie. It took longer mm. when you are weighing in a lot of voices. It took longer, but ultimately it, it, I really believe it made it better. Like we could have just, it, it, it could have been fine, but I feel like people sort of fighting for certain things forced everybody to kind of either let go or to really double down and really make it work. And I, I think that's why it's sort of a special film. And, and it, yeah. it could have, like I said, it could have gone the other direction and been a nightmare. But, and we even had two, we had two editors, <laughs> which I mean, everything it's like on, on paper, this would be a nightmare. Who does this? Yeah. Yeah. But it worked. It really did work. And um, like I said, it did take longer because it was important for me to sort of make sure that everybody was heard. And um, you know, it, it, that, that, that takes longer. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Is there a story behind the end roll when you're up in parasailing? Yeah. So that's, um, that's actual footage from my trip shortly after um, my, my divorce. When I, I never in a million years thought that would be, you know, footage at the end of a movie. <laughs> but um, I, right when I, we decided to, my ex and I decided to sign papers, I had sort of done my end and he, and he needed to sign his, the paperwork. And I, would, I had asked him to move out. I had this small window. I was I was given an opportunity to understudy on Broadway. I'd never had time and money at the same time. I either had one or the other. And I knew I was signing this year contract for a Broadway understudy where I wouldn't be able to go anywhere. So I had this very small window of time where I could go somewhere, but I was so heartbroken. I was like, I can't imagine going to a beach or something and laying out like- With all the honeymooners? Yeah. yeah. I was not um, in a place to do that. And so it was right around the time of New Orleans Katrina, right? Mm. Yeah, yes. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll sign up to go to help out with Habitat for Humanity and go down and help down there. And there wasn't a specific window for Habitat for Humanity that I had, like within my, with the amount that I had. And then randomly this window popped up to go to Thailand. And I was like, oh my God. It was like this very specific, like it was one day shy of the exact window that I had. And I was like, God, this feels like a sign a little bit. And I was like, I wish I were the kind of person who would do something like that. And then I was like, what if I were that person? What if I were the kind of person who just wrote, hey, I'm interested in this and then hit sent, you know, and then the next thing I knew I was getting in there and they wrote back and said, you're not going to believe this. We just had a cancellation. Is there any way you could get your shots by tomorrow? And I was like, uh, yes. Um, so the next thing I knew I was getting shots and I was on a plane and going, and I'm like, this, I, I've always thought of myself as a really scared person. And I was terrified, but I was so proud of myself that I was doing this by myself. Um, I, I mean, I was going with Habitat. So I knew I was meeting somebody that wasn't like I was just getting on a plane to Thailand. But still, it was so thrilling. And I remember I because I, I cried, even if I wasn't crying, tears were kind of falling out of my face for a good four months where even if I was smiling, it was almost like a faucet was just kind of dripping. So even if I was like, oh my gosh, hey, like I was constantly <laughs> wiping tears. And I remember arriving there and I was, my brain was completely re shifting in a way that was so exciting. I remember like four days in going, oh my gosh, I haven't cried. I should, I remember going specifically thinking I should have a, I should sit on the bed and have a good cry and really kind of connect with this. And I remember sitting on the bed going, yeah, no, I think I'm good. I'm good. I don't need to cry. And it had just, no one looked at me like, hey, are you okay? Oh, or, you how know, how are you? 
no one. And I remember saying the phrase X for the first time. So they were like, you know, it was like this, that, and the other thing. Oh, yeah, my ex. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Okay, I guess yeah. I'll just say my ex like that. And um, it was so beautiful. It turned out at the end of that trip, the very end of this two week trip, and we built a house for somebody and we like sweat our butts off and like built a house. And like, you know, I stirred cement and it was, it was incredible. And at the very end, one of the last days, we all went to this like little restaurant and one by one, we were all kind of sharing why we did this trip. And it was so beautiful. Like one sort of like wealthy kid that I kind of had pegged in a certain way initially was like, I kind of had a little bit of a nervous breakdown, you know, like my parents wanted me to go to this one school and I was there for a year and it wasn't a match. And so I just quit. So I needed time to kind of come back and get, you know, do something outside of myself to kind of, and then one by one, we all kind of shared these stories that were, <clears throat> we were looking to, to do something different for somebody else to get us out. And um, it was an incredible experience. And I, I, like, I remember saying, Finn, if you do this, you have to say yes to everything that comes. If there's a weird food that comes, don't ask what it is, just try it, you know? And so I was suddenly someone eating weird things that had fallen off trees with a little bit of spicy sauce. And I'm like, okay. And then they're like, we're going to go parasailing. And I was like, everything in me was saying, this is so dangerous. No. And uh, even the way it was being rigged and the, the, the ropes and the way it was being tied up, I was like, this is not safe. But um it was incredible. I, there was so, yeah. So it, and when I, when I first showed that footage to the guys, they were like, God, this is incredible. And we can't use it though. It's so pixelated. It's like, it's clearly from like a <laughs> hundred years ago and it wasn't, the, you know, and I, I didn't have the original file anymore. So it's like really pixelated, but um, I was like, we, if we decided at the end, we're like, that has to be there. That's yeah. 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 It's so great. And life affirming and what a wonderful thing. Ha has your ex-husband seen it? He hasn't, but I did actually see him. I met him for lunch uh, about a year or so ago when I was advised that someone's like, hey, you should probably, you know, I know it's not your story, but it's loosely based obviously on your, your marriage. So you should probably get him just to sign. And I was like, exactly. oh gosh, yeah. Um, so I asked if we could meet and I thought he was in Florida, but he was actually here. And so we got to meet and it was actually so nice to see him. It was bizarre. Um, cause we were best friends for ever, you know, and yeah. there he was. And so I know the server had to be like, what is this relationship? <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, we both, I've, I've since remarried and have a, a, a beautiful baby with my, with my husband, Mark, who, you know, and, and he's moved on and has a, a girlfriend and, and who has a daughter also. So we just talked about that and we talked about, you know, his family and I'm like, oh my gosh, how's your mom? Like, it was just really nice to see him. And at a certain point, I was kind of, I, I just missed him as my friend, you know, yeah. and it was, it was lovely. And at the, at the very end, I'm sorry, to, totally going to get emotional. Um, I did say, I don't know if you need to hear me say this, but I forgive you. Maybe you don't need to hear that, but I do. I forgive you. I said, it's, it's all okay. And he's like, thank you. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, life is difficult <laughs> and yeah, um, we have to let go because it's, um, it was important for me in this film to, to not make anyone the bad guy, you know? Um, yeah, you don't feel that he's the bad guy. You yeah. think he's a very decent person who made some bad choices and this isn't going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. I do think there's so many marriages like that. And there, there's so many gorgeous divorce movies, right? Where it's about, you know, people throwing stuff and just, you know, and, restraining orders and like I definitely want to act in something like that that sounds amazing but War of the roses <laughs> yes yes <laughs> and uh and I thought I just wanted to um to share a simpler story I mean it's it's I, I, a story that's um it's about people just it was good until it wasn't and then it was it was over and what is that like and um and that's what I wanted to explore, you know. So I think I, people are are enjoying it. So I'm I'm really I'm I'm proud of it. But it is um, it was important for me to sort of not. I wanted people to sort of look at at the David character and say like, oh wow, you know, that's he reminds me of um, my brother, or you know, he reminds me of so and so, and you know, he loved her, and and then it, he was he wanted out but didn't know how, you know, how to sort of yeah. say that, and that they're gonna they're gonna be okay, they're gonna be okay at the end. So. Well, I think you nailed it. <laughs> um, can we go back to, let's talk about your career as an actor. Like, how did you start out? How did you know you were going to be an actor? How'd uh, you get it? 
I was really, really shy. I'm still pretty shy, but um, I was really shy. And my mom talked me into taking a speech and drama class in junior high. And um, I, I just remember one of the first one of the first assignments was to do like a, a pantomime thing. And the whole class was cracking up and I was crying because I wasn't trying to be funny. But it was and to this day, I think it was probably one of the funniest things I've ever done because I love that kind of humor. I, I, I love humor when people are just earnest and um, mm-hmm and trying their best. And it's awkward. I love awkward humor. It's like, but once I realized, I just had to kind of make a shift in my head of sort of giving permission to be viewed in that way, then it became fascinating to me. It once I was, you know, that that style of acting. So I, you know, I took I, I took classes and stuff. And I, I just remember going to this leadership camp and, and, uh, for, and for like the Red Cross or something. And everybody was asleep while this one guy was talking up at the front about what, you know, what's your secret goal? What do you want to do? What do you want to, you know, be? And, um, and I was like, I, and I wrote down, I want to be an actor. And so ever since that day that I wrote down on that little piece of paper at camp that I was going to be an actor, I just did not, I was so determined. I just wouldn't do anything else. And I remember I'd only, I don't think I'd even been in a play at that point, but I just, you know, <laughs> I just think knew. I just knew. And I loved, I, well, I just remember thinking, uh, like watching like Laverne and Shirley and stuff as a kid. I'm like, can you imagine getting paid to do that? Like it just, and then we went to see a play in, in um, my sophomore year, I think it was, we went to see a play called the ghetto at the Mark Tate before. And I grew up in Southern California and mm-hmm. our teacher would always take us into LA to see sitcoms and, um, and, and plays. And it was a play about the Holocaust. And I remember yelling out in the, in the, from the audience. Cause I was so moved. And I was like, I have to do this. I have to be a part of this. I don't know how, but I have to be a storyteller in some way. So that's, that's been that. And then I went, I studied it in college and grad school and I've just kept plugging away. And I think I'm more determined than talented, to be honest. I'm just so stubborn. That. <laughs> I'm just pretty stubborn. I'm just sort of like, there's, a, there's room for me. I insist on like, there being I and I'm so inspired by certain artists that are not sort of like traditionally beautiful or traditionally you know I just I love when there's uh you know there's certain actors that I just find that that they create space for me when when they're when they're working and so I kind of want to insist on that for for other people too that I find that there's more room for men to look like men (laughs) in tv and film and then and for women it's sort of it's a little more of a it's getting much better um much better with you know but but even then, like even with being on Orange is the New Black was like a dream of mine. Because I remember when that came out, oh, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're just so not used to seeing women look like women, <laughs> like regular women. And uh, that was just a dream come true. That, that's how. Okay. Let's talk all about, all about that. Because that show was incredible. Because, yes, all kinds of women that you just fall in love with all of them. Yes. And also Black Lives Matter, Prison Industrial Complex. At exactly the right time. Like, it was all the things. How was that being on that set? Oh, my God. It's so funny because I auditioned for that show a couple of times for different roles. And uh, thank God I didn't get them because then <laughs> um, then Beth Hoffler came around. And showing up on that set, I was like, this, I know this sounds crazy, but at my age, I was like, I could quit now. I, and I won't, obviously. I love it. But I was like, this is what I dreamt of. It's having a complicated character and it wasn't that you know it wasn't that big of a part I mean it was you know it was memorable definitely but it wasn't like I was you know one of the main characters or anything it was just to play somebody that is more than just generic sweet mom or quirky secretary was a dream and um to return to the same set because as as an actor a lot of times I'm brought in like as a day player you come on for like a couple of days Mm -hmm. and you don't have time to really be comfortable to do your work in a real kind of real way because you're just like oh so nice to meet you and then where do I go okay and then your so your job is like get the ball over the plate for the fancy people you know what I mean like just yeah. don't just go get in, it over the plate your job. yeah and don't you don't there's no room for you to grow really <laughs> just <laughs> do the thing that you got paid to do and so this was so nice to show up and to just be able to play a little bit and to know people's names and, you know, know the camera guys, it, to know everybody. It was, it was, it was dreamy. And I, I, I like I say, I, there was a part of me that felt like I could quit now because, but I, but at the same time, I crave it. I, I, I dream of doing that again, to have that kind of a, uh, a job again. It was dreamy. 
Well, I assumed it was just watching it. And I'm so glad to hear that it actually was. Yeah. I, mean, I I sat there and watched the um I think the finale episode where everybody's saying goodbye as everybody's scene is ending and I'm just crying the whole time. So I'm like, oh my friends, I've been <laughs> I've been with you for so long. Like it was such a moving, important show. I wasn't in the last two episodes, I think. So I was really surprised when they did the whole, you know, I had my last scene. And I was getting ready to leave. And then they were like, and that's a wrap on. And I was like, you know, it was just to be a part of that. You know, it's just, there's, there's, a, I feel like there's a handful of shows that, you know, that you remember forever, you know, to say like, oh, he had a great part in, you know, Sopranos, or he was, he was this guy, you know, or she was this woman in on Cheers, or like, there's certain shows that are just like, will live forever. And I feel like this show is just revolutionary and, you know, meeting Genji and just, you know, that, that whole team was just incredible. And, but my character, unfortunately, no one liked my character. So I didn't get to interact with very many people, which, you know, I was always in the, like, you know, the groups where no one would hurt me, but so I didn't get to. Did, did she kill all her children? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she's not likable in that way. She's not really likable. <laughs> Although I will say I was so terrified because the fans are so amazing. Right. And they're so uh, initially they were kind of like, who are these new women? We hate them. You know, cause when, when they went to, when the characters went to maximum security, they were like, you know, some of the initial feedback from the, the, I was like, Oh God, Oh my God, I'm so scared. Cause you know, especially with my character, I'm like, they're not going to like me. And oh, we got to meet new people. We're invested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it was, uh, people, I think people really still related to her, which was really sweet and surprising, but they were, I mean, clearly she should not have been in prison. She should have had, Meant, you know, she should have Mental been someplace else. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, so many of the women there. I mean, it, yeah. You've been on so many iconic shows. I, I, I was seeing, were you also on House of Cards and Sopranos and, and, yeah. and, and, and? Yeah, that's what's great about, yeah. And, you know, fun, small, smaller parts, obviously, but, um, but just to, just to do that. One of my first jobs out of grad school was Sopranos. And uh, my agents were so excited. They're like, we don't usually have, a, you know, there's not a lot of female characters that aren't like at the Bada Bing Club or whatever, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> um, it was really, to be on that set was just, you know, um, we, we, I was invited to the table read and I could not get the smile off my face. I mean, it was just, we had to go around the room and introduce ourselves. You know, it was like, I'm so-and-so, so-and-so playing so-and-so, so-and-so. And they're going around the room and, you know, and just watching James Gandolfini and Edie Falco do their thing like across the table was just, you know. Was this like your first job? This was my first job out of grad school. Yeah. Could you believe you were in that room? No, 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 <laughs> no. Amazing. Yeah. So I know we are in COVID times, but uh, do you know what is next for you? I don't. I do not. Yeah, it's been tricky. I mean, my even my my amazing agents of 19 years, I was with leading artists and they were part of Silver Silver Massetti and Zap Mary is who I initially signed with 19 years ago. And then um, it became leading artists. And we, we, a few months ago, she was like, guys, we're not going to make it, you know? And it's oh, just, no. it, it's like, it's, this has really hit the city, especially because their, their constant bread and butter has always been their Broadway clients, you know, and um, it, there's no end in sight. So that was devastating. And I just kind of thought, well, I'll just catch my breath for a second. Obviously I'm trying to like find an agent right now is not ideal. And one of one of the one of the agents that I've been with for the whole time, Michael Kelly Boone, um, he's he's partnered back up with SMS talent. And so he said, you know, we'd like to bring you back on. I was like, Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> um, but there's just not that much happening right now. There's there's a few yeah. projects, but not in New York. It's still pretty, um, pretty slow. So we'll see. I'm I'm uh, I'm writing a lot, which is which is good, and I, I, not as much as I want to. As soon as I can, we sell the film, then I'll be able to really do it. I, I feel a little bit like I'm having an affair on this one until it's yeah yeah it's you um, finish it up. I do, I do. I'm, yeah. Do you have the bug now? Are you going to make another movie? I think so. I don't know that I'll do it in this way. The hardest way. The possible. hardest way, and of like begging. You know, I just. I've called in, I think, every favor that I have. Um, and thank God everyone's been amazing and is super proud of it. So that's all you sort of ultimately want. But I don't know that I could do this again in, in this way. Well, and hopefully you won't have to. I mean, you've proven it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, so speaking of the pandemic and Black Lives Matter and Me Too, um, what do you make of this moment we're sitting in? And I should say, note for the record, it's the end of September that we're talking because this will come out in a few months. Okay. Um, oof. 
I don't know. I, I have as a as a mom of a six year old girl, I it's hard not to go into panic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really this is really scary. This is the scariest time. I I I don't know to be honest. And I people that I know from where I grew up that are still supporting th- this sort of like fake Christian thing mm-hmm. is really disturbing to me. <laughs> That yeah. someone, you know, this, this, how somehow the most corrupt person is, is convincing people who believe in Jesus. Uh, it, that's been, that's been the hardest part for me because it's um, baffling. It's baffling. And it's the exact opposite of, you know, the Jesus that, that I personally believe in. <laughs> so um, that's been, that's been really hard. And I, I think I, in a way, maybe it's good that I have this information that I know that that's out there. I purposely like kept some of them near so that I know what's actually, it's easier to be like, Oh, unfollow, or we're not friends anymore. But like, I think it's important for us to know what's out there and what's being said. And um, yeah, I have to focus on getting this film done. And, but there's so many things that, you know, like even this social network, film that that's out um that my husband watched it and I was like I can't watch it right now because I need Ooh. to yeah um yeah, no it's such a dilemma it's, social dilemma thank you I am baffled by it I I am sort of I I don't I I'm terrified and I you know when I went to the polls four years ago with my daughter um uh, my goal was just not to gloat and you know to just put my vote in and you know so um and I think we were blindsided last time yeah yeah so I'm really, I am, my heart is warm to the fact that there are so many Republicans, not enough, but there are so many Republicans who are, who are stepping up and saying like, Hey, we, this is there, America first. And, and some are like, I am not a fan of Joe Biden, but I will vote for America over this. And that, that is helpful for me to feel like there's an, there is a chance. Um, but it's, a strange time. Yeah, it's a roller coaster for sure. What advice do you have for women coming up behind you? I would say to insist that there's room for you, um, no matter sort of what you lead with. And actually, the more, the further you are from what you think of as sort of like traditional whatever, the more interesting, <laughs> the more value. And to insist that there is room for you in whatever that is, whether it's as an actor or producer, whatever, you know, we we need that. And there is room. And um, a really great guy named Matt Malloy, an actor friend of mine, um, we, we were, he was actually in the same movie that Katie and I, we did um, Morning Glory together. And he handed me this little blue book, this small little book. And I said, what is this? And it was at the time that my marriage was falling apart. And actually during that time, I was I was pregnant with the, the, the pregnancy that I ended up losing, but nobody knew that. So it was bizarre because my life was tipped upside down. I didn't know what was happening. My ex was not really communicating with me. I didn't know that about the affair at that point. And here I was sitting next to th- these huge movie stars. It, so I'm sitting there and it's like, Harrison, Affinity, have you met Harrison? I'm like, hi, <laughs> my life is so weird right now. Like my life is so <laughs> strange that I'm saying hi to Harrison Ford and my world. It's like, what the hell? Um, All the things. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and that was one of the things too, that I was like, someday this will be funny, but it is so weird. Yeah. Um, but Matt handed me this book and he said, I said, what is this for? And he goes, he didn't know anything about what, what was going on in my personal life, but he said, you need to write. I said, what? And he goes, you need to write. And I said, uh, okay, I've never written anything. He goes, no one's going to write anything for you and I. And he's like this great character actor, you know, bald character actor guy. He goes, there's, there's not going to be anything that's perfect for us. We have to create something. And I remember seeing a little bit before I wrote, I saw Miranda July's um, You, Me and Everyone We Know. And I was like, who is this person? Who is this magical human that is that we're going to follow in this story? And think, I was like, where did they find her? Like, how in the hell did they find her? She is like perfect for this. And then I realized that she, you know, that she, the, she was behind it. It was her baby and she wrote it. And I was like, wow, she insisted that there was room for her. And my God, is there room? And not only just for her, because she did that, it just kind of made everyone, including me go, I, I, I could be, that's, there's room for me. So that's what I would say is like, and even if you don't think of yourself as a writer, see if you can, because I'm so, the fact that I will have something that I can point to that is sort of my sense of humor, my heart, the kind of people I like to work with. I, I, I love that I have that. And even if that was a two minute short or, or like in this case, it was a feature, but see if you can create something that you're proud of that without waiting for 
approval from people, you know, to invite you to the table. But I love that so much. Insist that there is room for you. That's yeah. so good. We're going to tweet that. <laughs> I'm going to say thank you so much for doing this. This was such a joy to talk to you. Oh, thank you, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank the Nerdy Steves for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. Thanks for listening. See you next time.